All right, 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. We see he starts off here talking about spiritual gifts. Look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Unfortunately, we have a lot of people these days that are ignorant about spiritual gifts and what they are and the importance of them. And, and really, the, the biggest thing I think people are ignorant of are what a, what a spiritual gift even is. People seem to, to talk about spiritual gifts and they, and they just add all kinds of different things. Whatever it is that comes to their mind, well, this is my gift, this is my spiritual gift. Now, you may be gifted in a certain area of your life, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a spiritual gift. We'll take a look at these. The Bible lists up, and we'll get into them as we, as we read through here. But the gifts of the Spirit that are specifically named in this chapter are wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, diverse kinds of tongues, and interpretation of tongues. There's nine gifts of the Spirit that are specifically mentioned by name in this chapter. And we should not be ignorant of these gifts. Now, we're not some charismatic, Pentecostal type of church that believes in the, 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 these holy rollers that fall on the ground and they think they're full of the Spirit and they're babbling in some just not even a real language, just, just foaming at the mouth and... And, and acting like they're epileptic. But there are, just because there are false religions out there, just because there are people who get possessed by devils and do weird things and they call that being filled with the Spirit, doesn't mean that there's not spiritual gifts. And the Bible talks about them here in, in chapter 12, and we're going to look at them a little bit closer as we continue here. Look at verse number 2. He says, Ye know that you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God called Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. He's reaffirming the, the obviously that, that Christ is the Lord, and you know the Corinthians were Gentiles that he's writing to, and that they had these dumb idols, these false gods. And he's just explaining, look, when you see someone... Because especially at that time, what was a contending religion? You had the Jews, right? And they did not believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. They did not believe that Jesus Christ was Lord. So he's saying here, you know, hey, if someone, you know, hear someone speaking, you know, um, and calling Jesus accursed, that's not coming from the Spirit of God. And likewise, if you have someone saying that Jesus is Lord, he's saying, you know, that's of the Holy Ghost. Verse 4, now he goes into in more depth on explaining these gifts. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. So the Spirit is what gives the gift. The Spirit is what provides you to have the power to have these great gifts that are bestowed upon men by the Holy Ghost. He's saying even though the gifts are, are different, you know, uh, having the gift of, gift of interpreting languages is very different from having the gift of prophecy, but it's still all the same Spirit that gives out those gifts, is what he's explaining here. Even though they may look very different, it's one Spirit that, that is giving out the gift. Verse 5, And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. Just like we have different churches, there's different offices in the church, there's different administrations, there's different things, but it's all one God that we're serving. Now, this is not being very ecumenical and broad and just saying, oh, well, everyone who even calls themselves a Christian, yeah, well, there's all these different churches, but we all serve the same God. That's the, the extreme that people want to take a verse like this to, which is just garbage. Because he's, he's explaining, I mean, this is very specific about Jesus Christ. And when you look at the Bible as a whole and all the doctrine, it's very clear what he's talking about here. I mean, the vast majority of Christian religions don't even have salvation, right? Because they believe in, a, in some type of a works-based salvation. And the Bible couldn't be more clear that it's not of works. It has nothing to do with our works. And people who believe in works are not saved. Let's keep reading our verse number six or verse number seven. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man 
to profit with all. This is a very important verse because the whole point of receiving a gift from God, these spiritual gifts, it's given every man to profit. Now, it is there to profit. It doesn't mean your own financial gain as these name it, claim it, prosperity preachers will have you believe that they probably think, oh, I've gotten this spiritual gift to preach, so I'm going to use it for my profit. They look at verses like that because they have a wicked heart. No, God wants us to be profitable servants unto him. God gives us special gifts and different abilities that we have that we are specifically better at some of these things because God has given us that gift. And if you know that you have one of these gifts, then you need to be using it to profit God. What are these gifts? It says in verse 8, For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. Some people have more wisdom than others, and that's a gift given to them by the Spirit where they've, excuse me, been given extra wisdom. They've given like, you know, a double portion of wisdom. Now, everyone has some wisdom to some degree, but this is talking about a spiritual gift that's been given to someone that makes them very wise. And, and you know, with all of these gifts, I believe that God doesn't just, um, you know, you may, you may be given a gift, but you're not going to see it until you start exercising it and using it. You know, you won't even realize maybe God has given you a gift of wisdom, and, but you're never going to have it fully until you actually get in the Bible and start studying and reading and learning and, you know, listening and, and, and really exercising that knowledge. It says, to another, the word of knowledge by the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. Now, obviously, again, this is talking about extra. This is talking about more because this is a spiritual gift that's given more to Everybody has some degree of, of wisdom. Everyone has some degree of knowledge. If you're saved, everybody has some degree of faith. Even if you're not saved, I mean, your faith could be in something else. But this is an extra amount of faith that God will give unto people. And, you know, we see in the scripture people saying, you know, Lord, increase our faith. That this is the disciples said to Jesus, hey, you know, help us to have more faith. Increase our faith. It's a good thing to desire to have more faith. What's faith? What's faith? It's faith is believing in, the, in what you can't see and what you don't know and what, or what you, what you can't see and what's not right in front of you, right? It's not what you don't know. Faith is believing in that which is unseen. And when you have a lot of faith, when you have extra faith, you know, as a family that's planning on moving out here soon, that takes some extra faith to be able to just say, hey, we're going to, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to sell it. I'm going to sell it. We're going to sell our house. We're just move, we're going to we're find a new job, get a new house, a whole new place to live, and we're going to take that step by faith because we believe we're doing the right thing to serve God and that God wants us to be in this area. That is something that requires a little bit of extra faith than most people are used to. And that is a spiritual gift of, of the Holy Ghost. The Bible says, To another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. So he's talking about here healing people who are sick, working miracles. Now, some of these gifts, I don't believe, are necessarily still being given out today, like the working of miracles. Now, it's possible that they could still be given out. but um, And I'll go into this more when we go over uh, chapter 14, because I'm really going to cover the whole speaking with other tongues thing. And, and explain that to you. And some of these other gifts, like working of miracles, can be tied in with, that, uh, with the speaking with tongues. And that there were certain abilities and powers given unto the disciples and unto the apostles that confirmed the word that they preached through the miracles that they did. And that once the word was confirmed, once the New Testament was confirmed, girls, everybody sit down in your chairs right now. Once the New Testament was confirmed, I believe that those miracles were no longer necessary. God is still God capable of anything. I do believe miracles are possible today, and we pray for miracles, and I don't doubt that they can happen. However, we don't see the same amount of miracles that was going on right after the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ that his disciples had around that whole time. Because the Bible explicitly says that they were confirming, they confirmed the word. And that the, uh, the power of the Spirit confirmed what they were preaching. We have the word confirmed already. 
There is no need for it to be confirmed by God. It has already been confirmed. It has already been preserved and continues to be preserved. So as we're reading through this, this list of, of gifts, you know, a lot of these I believe are still given today, but some of them I'm not so sure are, are being doled out today. Not to say that they won't be doled out again in the future, though. Because right at the end times, that last generation, the Bible says the believers are going to be doing many exploits and doing a lot of good things for God. And I think that it's going to be very possible that there will be um, more of these gifts being given that were also around in Jesus' day. But that's more of my, my personal opinion about that. But let's keep reading through these gifts. So we saw mir working miracles, prophecy. Prophecy is, is mainly just preaching. You know, people have a tendency to think of only future events when it comes to the word prophecy. But prophecy is not um, only talking about future, future prophecies. It's talking about all prophecy of the Scripture, all um, preaching, all of the, the Word of God being preached is, is prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits, being able to, to tell between spirits, good spirits, bad spirits, you know, being able to know the difference, that's what discernment is. To another, diverse kinds of tongues, and of course tongues is just a language, having a knowledge, understanding different languages, and it says, and to another, the interpretation of tongues, being able to translate another language to another language. So... There's many gifts that are given here. It says in verse 11, But all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So, as God wants to, whatever God decides are the gifts that he wants to give to you. Listen up, because this is important. God decides what gifts that you give. Now, you may look at somebody else and say, wow, that person's really gifted in many areas. They're really good at this. They're really good at that. They have this spiritual gift and that one and this one and that one. And God really gave them a lot. Well, praise the Lord for that person. Maybe, maybe you only have one spiritual gift. Maybe God hasn't given that much to you. But look, God gives it to people as he will, the way that he wants to do it. So we need to first and foremost is keep that in our minds. That whatever God has given us, we need to be content therewith. We need to, to understand that He has given it to us for a specific reason. And we need to not be focused so much about what other people have, but what we have, and being able to do the best with what we have. And find the gifts that God has given unto us and use them to profit with all, which is the whole reason why you were given that gift in the first place. Instead of ignoring your gift and focusing on what you don't have, focus on what you do have so you can be profitable unto God. He goes on further to explain this. Verse number 12 and likens this unto a body. He says, For as the body is one and hath many members... And all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. He's saying, think about your body. Your body is made up of many members. So you have fingers. You have arms. You have a head. You have a neck. You have legs. You have toes. You have feet. These are all different members of your body. They, they all make up one body. All of the pieces of my body together make up one body. All the members. He says, so also is Christ. Verse 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. When you get saved... You are, you are made into the, you are put into the body of Christ, is what he's saying. In, into one, by one spirit, we're baptized into one body. We, he says it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew, whether you're a Gentile, whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're male, whether you're female, what, whatever, wherever you're at, whatever you might be able to look at each other and say what the differences are. No matter how different you may appear from somebody else on the outside, if you're both believers, you're one in Christ. You're part of that same body. The Bible says in verse 14, For the body is not one member, but many. 
My whole body is not my finger. This is, this is not my whole body. My whole body is all of the members together, the whole thing. Verse 15, if the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? So what's he talking about here? Just because you are not some other member of the body does not mean you are not part of the body. So he gives an example. You're saying, look, if the foot says, well, it's not like I'm the hand, you know, I mean, the hand, of course, the hand is part of the body, but I'm just the foot. He's saying, just because you're not the hand, does that mean you're not part of the whole body? No, of course not. That's ridiculous. Or he gives the other example here of the ear. If the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body. You're saying, well, of course, the eye is so important. I mean, the eye is what makes you see. If you didn't have the eye, you'd be stumbling around and falling. You wouldn't know where to go. He said, I'm just the ear. No, the ear is just as much a part of the body as the eye is. And look, listen up, because everybody needs to get this clear, especially in this church. We all have different gifts that God has given unto us. And you can't be looking at yourself and saying, well, you know, I'm not the pastor. Just because you're not the pastor of the church doesn't mean you're not part of the body. Everybody, every member, and that's why, you know, churches are called church members. If you are a member of this church, you are a part of our church body, and you're part of the body of Christ. Now, just as my body has all kinds of different members that all do different things. My hands are really good at doing things that hands do. They're good at grabbing. They're good at punching. They're good at feeling. They're good at touching. But they're terrible at seeing. They're terrible at hearing. They don't know how to do that. My eye is great at seeing. Well, it's getting worse, but my eyes are still, that's their function. They're really good at it. It's really complicated. Everything that goes involved in the sight, that's the special gift that my eye has. But they can't hear anything. They're deaf. They can't speak. My eye can't go for a walk. But it's a very important part of the body. You individually as a church member, whether you're a man, a woman, a boy, or a girl, however old you are, it doesn't matter. If you are a member of this church, you have an important function. You have a job that God wants you to do as part of this body. Some jobs may be more uh, desirable than others on, on an outward appearance. You might look and be like, man, I don't want to be some foot. I don't want to be the stinky foot. Who wants to be the stinky foot? But do you know how important the stinky foot is? How else are you going to be able to, to, to bring the gospel of peace to people without the stinky foot? It has a very, very, very important job. It may not be the most pretty. It may not be the most attractive, but it is a very, very important functional job of that member of the foot to have as part of the whole body. And every member is important. Not everybody thinks that what they're good at is very important, but it is. Let's think about the jobs of this church and the different members and, and, the, and the things that people could be doing in this church. Some people have musical talent. They have a gift given to them of God to be able to play music. Now, if you have an ability, you may not even know what gifts God has given you, first of all, if you never try anything. If you just sit there and say, oh, I, I don't have any gifts. I don't think I'm good at anything. You will never know what you're good at until you try. You need to start, start taking on, especially if you're someone who thinks, I don't have any skills. Now, some people already know what their gifts are. Some people know what they're good at. Some people, it's very easy to determine, yes, I know, I'm good at this. Okay, well, if you're good at that, then why don't you use that gift to profit God, to do something good for God? And if you don't know what your gift is, start trying something new. 
Maybe if you tried to start learning a musical instrument, for example, just as one example, you'd realize, wow, I'm, I actually picked this up really easy. I get this. This isn't that hard. It's not that difficult. You have an ear for it. You're able to tell. You could hear the, the, the sounds. You could hear the rhythm. You could hear the tones. You can hear the pitch. You can hear all these things because God has given you the ability to do that. There's plenty of jobs that you can do. Maybe you're really good at listening. Maybe you're someone that, that's good at giving advice and, and being able to hear other people's problems. Maybe you're very good at uh, teaching and relating things to other people and being able to break things down to be real simple, to be really easily understood. There are lots and lots of gifts that you can use within this body, within this church. And don't ever think that you are not an important member because everybody here is important. Everybody. <clears throat> now another point I want to bring up about the, about the body here because we see here the, the different aspects, the different pe part, members of the body kind of looking, saying, oh, well, I'm not the eye, or I'm not this, I'm not that, that member. That is not going to be good to have a unified body if you're always looking at somebody else's gifts and wishing you had their gifts instead of focusing on your own. We as a church, as a body here, we need to be unified. We can't be worried about other people and looking at what other people are doing and what their gifts are. We have to focus on our own and, and try to be the best member that we can be. Do, per, perform the best function that we have been given gifts to perform. <laughs> See here, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself in the notes. Let's keep reading here. Verse number... 17, if the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. So we see here, look, what if our church was just consisted of, or what if your body, first of all, he's using the example he gave here, what if every member of your body was all an eye? My fingers were eyes, everything, everything about me was just eyes. Well, all I would be able to do is see then. I wouldn't be able to hear. I wouldn't be able to smell. I wouldn't be able to taste. I wouldn't be able to do anything else except see. That would not be a complete body. You say, well, what if, what if everybody, what if the whole body were ears? Then all we'd be able to do is hear, but we'd be blind. We wouldn't be able to taste. All of these things would be lacking. We need a diverse church. We need a church full of members that all have different abilities, different gifts, different functions, and we don't all need to be focused and worried about having the same exact gift. Just because one person has a great gift, you don't have to be, you know, we don't all have to look at the person who plays the piano and say, we all want to do exactly that and become that proficient in that one thing. Because first of all, not everyone's going to have that gift. And second of all, if that's all all of us were, we're just that, had that one thing, we would be lacking in so many other areas. We need to be able to find what we're good at, what, what our role is, what God would be pleased for us to be doing. As in verse 18 says, But now hath God set the members, every one of them, to body. Look, God's the one that builds the church. God's the one that brings the members into this body. And he puts the members in here as it pleases him. And we need to keep that in mind with our service to God that we ought to be pleasing to him with what we're doing. The things that we're good at, we ought to be able to perform it to the best of our ability in order to please God. Verse number 19. And if they were all one member, where were the body? So if everything's just one thing, then it's not even a body anymore. If everything's an eye, there is no body. You're, it's just one big eyeball. Verse 20, but now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you.
Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. What is all this saying here? Let's go through it real quickly. He's saying you can't have one part of the body saying, well, we don't have any need of this person. And you know what? We ought never to have that attitude within this church. Oh, well, if so-and-so drops out of the church, who cares? It's not really going to affect us anyway. Yes, it will, because that's one. it's like chopping off a finger. You lose a member of your body, it'll have an impact. Now, you might not realize what their strength is, but God has given them an ability. God has given them a purpose within this church or else they wouldn't be here. Unless they're just an infiltrator trying to split the church. But they still have a purpose. But the people that God has joined together within this church are all here and they all have a purpose. They are a member. And if you're not living up to, to what your work is, to what your gift is, then shame on you. You ought to be. But God has given you a function. If God made you an eye, don't always just have your eye closed. Right? Because then you're not going to be doing any good. You're just going to be sleeping. If God made you the eye and He's given you this great gift of vision, keep your eyes open. Use them. Use them as much as possible. See everything that you can see. We don't want to hide our gifts, but rather we want to figure out what they are. Get more involved in the church. Get, get, think of what you can do more. Think about what you're doing right now to benefit the church, to benefit the whole body, to do the service of God. And then start thinking, well, what else can I do? What am I not doing? Am I even focused on serving God? Or is everything else in my life more important than actually serving the Lord? Do I care more about what's going on at home and what's going on with family members and what's going on here and my hobbies and these other things that I like to do and taking vacations? Is all of that more important? If it is, then your priorities are messed up. None of those things in and of themselves are, are wrong or sinful or bad, but where are your priorities? Are they in church? Are, are you trying to figure out where your skill set is and where you can be the best blessing and, and the best member of this church or, or this body? Everybody's important. We can't look at any one member and say, you're not important. We don't need you. We could just cut you off. You could just, you could just get out of here. Every member has value. And the Bible explains here in verses 23 and 24 that, you know, the parts of our body that we think are less honorable, that don't get all of the attention, that don't get all the, the glamour and the fame and what everybody thinks is the best part, it says... Upon these we bestow, bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts, uncomely means they're not pretty, they're not beautiful, right? Have more abundant comeliness. Why? It's because of the way that we value things. For Like when I brought up the stinky feet, right? Feet are not comely. They're not attractive, especially my feet. There's all kinds of problems with them. But when you look at them, you'd say, oh man, I don't want that. But actually... The feet perform an extremely important job and they are, um, they are given more honor, right? I praise God that I actually have working feet to be able to go out and do all of the work that I do, work to provide food for my family as well as work for the Lord and going out and knocking on doors and preaching the gospel. Very, very important to have that, that, that member of my body. Doesn't look the best, doesn't smell the best, but you know what? It's a very, very important member. 
The Bible says here in verse 24, for our comely parts have no need. And you think about the things that make a person, what well, you might say it makes a person beautiful, you know, oh, their hair or, or, or you know, the color of their eyes. Well, a lot of these things, they don't really serve a big purpose. They just look attractive. <laughs> for our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. Verse 25, that there should be no schism in the body. So God weighed everything out and balanced it all out so that you might not be the most attractive, but he's given you many more skills to make up for that, for that unattractiveness. He says, so that there's no schism. And schism's like a division where, where you have your body divided against itself. We do not need a church divided against itself. We need to be able to love everybody within this church, except every member within this church. And the only time that we cause any type of separation is when there's a sin that's worthy of somebody being shunned, being, being not talked to, being, being someone that you don't sit down with that is not allowed to be in the church that is in major sin. But other than somebody being in major sin, there is no reason to be, um, to be having a schism or a division within the body. It says, but that the members should have the same care one for another. You should care about every member of this church. Every member of this church is important. Whether you like them or not personally, whether, whether someone has a, has a personality that, that rubs you the wrong way, they're a member of the, of the body. And they have, a, they have a role to perform. And maybe they are that eye and their eye is just closed. Well, the rest of the body needs to encourage it. Maybe we need the hand to go over there and go, hey, open up your eye and start seeing again. We need the, the body to come together instead of the, the, the body to go, oh, we don't need this eye anymore and pluck it out. No, just because the eyelid was closed doesn't mean the eye was useless. The eyelid just needed to be opened. And when you have church members, look, every church member is important. Whether or not they're utilizing their gift, they have a gift. God has them here for a reason. I praise God for every single member of this church. And when, when members are missing here, the church is not complete. The body is not whole. And unfortunately, this body has not been whole for a very long time. We have been working at at incomplete capacity for a very long time. And it's something that we need to get fixed. It's something we need, and instead of, of, of having disdain for people, oh, well, this person never comes to church, or that person, you know, no, we need to say that person needs more help. That's a part of our body that needs a little bit more attention, that needs to, to get plugged in more to be an active member of this body. Until we have a, a functioning body, we're not going to be doing the, the, the most of our potential that God has for us to do for Him. We will not be doing the works to the best of, our, of the, the ability of the entire body until the whole body is working together. Verse number 26, And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And that's where he just spells out everything I've been talking about here. He gives all of these references to parts of the body and he, and he brings it all together saying, well, look, you're the body of Christ and members in particular, just as much as all of those references had to do with being part of the body. And he says here, you know, if one member suffers, we should all suffer with that one member. We should all be caring about member. When, when one member of this church is going through something difficult and something hard, hey, we should all suffer with that person. We should all be there to help them out. And if someone rejoices, something good happens, hey, be happy for that person. Don't look, look at them that we're like, oh, man, why did you get that? You know, I should have that and have a wicked heart about someone else receiving good. Someone gets a raise at their, at their job, praise the Lord. Well, now they're making twice as much as I do. I could have used that raise instead of them. Don't have that attitude. Rejoice with that member. Praise God that they're doing well. We are a body. We need to act like a body. We need to be here as a member of a body that, that suffers with the other members. 
Just as much as I, but just, just within the past week or two, I think of one part of my body that suffered in my sinuses. And it just caused this dripping, 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 all this, all this stuff. And you know how much that caused? My whole, all the members of my body were suffering as a result of that one problem. Whatever the cause was, I mean, I'm not exactly sure, but what was causing that reaction caused my throat to suffer. It caused my ears to suffer. It caused my body and, and muscles to suffer. It caused a lot of parts of my body to suffer because one part of the body had a problem. And that's the way that a body should work. And I'll tell you what, my, my body members all acted together then to try to get that one problem solved. I mean, even my brain was working right. I think, what can I do to get this to go away? The body needs to work together, especially when there's problems. We should all care about each member of this church just as you would care about every one of your own personal body members. Just as much as you care about your fingers and your toes and your tongue and your eyes and your ears, every piece of your body, we need to be caring about every, other, every member of this church. Verse 28, And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, at, and notice the, notice the, the, the wording of this sentence, of this verse. It's putting an order of importance. Now, the reason why I even point this out, I'll get that in a minute. Let's just, let's just read this verse and look at what the order is because he says, first, second, third, after that, right, which would be fourth, and then, which would be fifth. And he orders all these different things. Says, God has set some in the church, first, apostles, secondarily, prophets, thirdly, teachers. So one of the first three things that God establishes in the church is, look, God has given you apostles. Now, apostles were the people that were with Christ, right? The primary teachers. The apostles were the ones given all these extra spiritual gifts and powers. <coughs> they were at the top. And then, prophets, other preachers. Thirdly, Teachers, people really good at explaining and teaching the Word of God. After that, miracles. I mean, think about that. You would think, wow, if somebody has this gift of performing a miracle, healing somebody who's sick, walking on water, whatever it may be, performing some kind of a miracle, miraculous event. That's fourth in God's list here. He says, I've given you a first apostles, prophets, and teachers. Now when we're looking at positions or, or things that we can do to serve God or spiritual gifts, what should we be looking to? Well, the first three things he mentioned, they're apostles, prophets, and teachers. And then miracles. And then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Now, the reason why I'm even bringing all this up is because what's really funny to me is that the last thing mentioned in this whole list is diversities of tongues, being able to speak other languages. That's the least important in this whole list. For a long time, when I go out soul winning, I run across these Pentecostals down in South Phoenix. And they were so hung up on, well, do you speak in tongues? Yeah, but are you speaking with tongues? And they get their whole church, so, why well, are you speaking in tongues? And everyone, in order to show that you're spirit-filled, and they're always, you have to be speaking with tongues. And that's at the bottom of the barrel. Bottom of the barrel. It's the last thing. They don't care that you're a teacher, which is way higher in this list than having diversities of tongues. They don't care that you're a help, which is higher on the list than having diversities of tongues. That's not what they wanted to know. I remember talking to one man specifically, just, just would not let them. Have you spoken in tongues? Do you speak in tongues? Says, yes, I speak Spanish. That's not what I'm talking about. Well, that's what the Bible's talking about. It's a language. It's a language that profits God. And we'll get into all of that when we do chapter 14. 
because it's profitable unto other people to hear the word of God in their native language. It is not profitable for anybody to hear someone go, hey, blah, 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 blah. because nobody understands that. And someone who says they understand that is a liar because they don't, because it's not a real language, because I just made that up, because I just made whatever sound comes out of my mouth. They say, oh, but when the Holy Spirit does it, then that's a real language. Yeah, when the Holy Spirit does it, it's a real language, but it never sounds like that. It sounds like Spanish. It sounds like Korean. It sounds like Arabic. It sounds like a real language because the Holy Ghost worked in real languages. That's what a tongue is. Not in, not in gibberish and nonsense like the Pentecostals would have you believe. Verse 29, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret? Look, of course not. Not everyone in the church is an apostle. Not everyone in the church has this gift or that gift or this gift because we're different members. And this is the point, the whole theme of this chapter 12 is trying to explain that you are different. You are a unique member of this church, of this body. But you're a very important part of this body, whatever member you are. You have a job to do that God wants you to do to help the whole body to be at its top performance. And instead of worrying about what other people are doing, what other, what other job some other member of the church has, it's not your concern. Focus on your job and what you can do to be the best member that you can be. It says verse 31, But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. We ought to covet. You know, the Bible says not to covet. And, and basically the covetousness that we should not have is coveting other people's stuff and, and goods and, and, and everything else. But he says that you can covet earnestly the best gifts. It's good to want to have a gift from God. And you could pray that God will, will give you a gift, that the Holy Spirit will, will pour out a gift upon you that you can use to serve Him with. And it's good to want to have something that's good like this, that God is the one that's responsible for giving to you and asking God for the best gifts. And what are the best gifts? Well, look at what he men mentioned first, right? He mentioned apostles, prophets, and teachers. I think being a teacher is a great thing. I think everybody should strive to be able to teach. Why? Because it'll help you to do a commandment that we're all responsible for doing anyways. If you're born again, you ought to be preaching the gospel to every creature. And the best way to do that is to be able to, to be a teacher, in a sense. To be able to show somebody and to make the gospel simple and easily understood. You don't have to be the best teacher in the world to do that. But if you're striving, if, you, if you're coveting earnestly spiritual gifts and you're looking at things to, to get better at, how about becoming a teacher, being able to understand something, have the wisdom and the knowledge and the understanding to be able to communicate that idea to somebody else. Even the women should be able to teach. Now the Bible says in Titus um, or in 1 Corinthians 14, we'll, we'll um, cover that a little bit more when we go through this, but the Bible says, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. So the woman's role is not to teach within the church. But just because the role is not to teach within the church, like, like get up behind the pulpit and teach the congregation the Bible, does not mean that the woman never teaches. 
Okay, this job is a job, the, 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 the bishop or the pastor, or the elder, is a job ordained for men. That's the way that the Bible says. And the Bible says that beyond, even beyond that, when, when it's time for learning, when it's time for the preaching, the women ought to remain silent in the church. I believe that goes as far as saying amen. Women are to keep silent. And if you have a question, if you need to learn something, says ask your husband at home. It's a shame for women to speak in the church. But just because it's a shame for women to speak in the church during the preaching does not mean that a woman is never able to teach. Turn if you would to Titus chapter 2. We're done in 1 Corinthians. Turn if you would to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, verse number 3, the Bible reads, The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. So here, it's talking about the, the elder ladies in the church, the women, being teachers of good things. But what should they be teaching? They're not teaching behind the pulpit. What are they teaching? Verse 4, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, Chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. We get a lot out of this verse. When a woman is not obedient to their husband, when a woman is not a keeper at home, when a woman is not discreet, when a woman is not chaste, when a woman is not a keeper at home, is not good, is not sober, doesn't love their husband or doesn't love their children, they're blaspheming the word of God. That is why it's the older women's job to say, hey, younger women, you know, this may be a little bit difficult for you to be obedient to your own husband, but I'll tell you what, you need to do it that, that God's word isn't blasphemed. You say, how is God's word going to be blasphemed? When someone says, well, the Bible says that the woman's supposed to be, the wife's supposed to be in subjection to her own husband, yet that Christian lady doesn't care what her husband says. She's got her own will and her own mind. That blasphemes God's word. When the Bible says that you ought to be chaste and discreet, and you, Christian lady, are talking about things that, that are ashamed to be spoken of them, that are the, the things that the, the, the wicked world does in secret. That blasphemes the word of God. But there is a time for teaching. And everybody should be a teacher. And I, you know, I point out the women here because I just wanted to make that, that point that we're going to get to in 1 Corinthians 14 about, you know, you're not going to be the teacher within, you know, from behind the pulpit during the congregation time of the, of the church. But you still can be teaching within the church when you teach the other ladies how to be a good wife, how to be godly. You can teach them individually. You can make friends with them and, and show them the right way and be a teacher that way. Men could be teachers. Even children could be teachers. Teach other children. It's a good gift to covet, to want, to desire to have. To be able to teach other people and to be able to do all those things. The Bible says it's you know, good to cover those things. He says, but I show unto you a more excellent way. And we'll see that in chapter 13. Let's borrow have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the instruction that you've given us in the Bible. Dear Lord, I pray that you would please help us to um, have discernment that we're not ignorant of the spiritual gifts, dear Lord. That we know what they are. And uh, I pray that you would please bestow upon us these spiritual gifts. God, uh, give us abundance of, of blessing. From your, from your spirit, dear God, and help us to, to find what our function is, what, what uh, part of the body of this church here that we are, and, and what roles we can fill, and, and what we can do to be the best member of this body, dear Lord. Help us to, to understand what that is, and to get better at what those skills are, dear Lord. 
and to um, not be afraid to try new things, to discover what all of our skills are and gifts that you've already given us our dear Lord, so that we don't have to be sitting here begging for gifts when you might be up there in heaven saying, I've already given you gifts, but you're not doing anything with it, dear God. Help us to know what those gifts are. Help us not to be afraid to try new things within the church, to, to discover our skill sets, dear Lord. And we pray that you would please just add more members to our body here, God, and, and help us to be unified as one complete body. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen.